Okay, I think we'll start the webinar. Welcome everyone to Expanding Community Involvement in Rural Communities. Um, I'm Leah Green, the Rural Technical Assistance Specialist at the Resource Sharing Project. And also with us today will be Eric Stiles, who is the Rural Project Specialist with NSVRC. But we'll hear a little bit more from him later. I just want to welcome everyone to the webinar and let you know that if you have any technical difficulties with iLink, please contact 1-800-799-4510. So um, if any of you are new to iLink, I'll just give you a brief tour. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, you should see a picture of my beautiful smiling face. And just below me should be a list of all the other participants. So you can see who else is on the webinar. Just below that is a feedback bar where during the webinar we might be um, asking questions um, and ask for your response. So right now while we're just adjusting to iLink, um, let's do a, a yes, no feedback. If you can see the feedback bar, click yes. Awesome, it looks like everybody's finding that feedback bar, great. Just below the feedback bar, there is a bar called chat, and you should be able to see some chats from me to you, and if anyone um, messages in there, you can see everyone else's chats in the public bar, and then you can also pull up the private tab if there's, if anybody says anything uh, super awesome and you wanna message them and be like, oh, where did you find that resource? Um, if you want to do that privately in any way, you can just message them um, privately there. In the center of the screen should be the webinar. If it's not, just make sure you have up at the top the tab that says Expanding Community Involvement pulled up, and you should be able to see the webinar. So we're going to do some more polling. We'll do, what does your agency do? So A, you only work with sexual violence survivors, B, only domestic violence survivors, C, you work with both sexual violence and domestic violence, or D, you do some other sort of community or statewide work. Okay, so it looks like we have mostly um, sexual violence and domestic violence um, workers with a few on, that work only with sexual violence. Great. Okay, so now what do you do at your agency? A, you are an advocate or you do some sort of direct service type work. B, you're a program manager, or some sort of supervisory staff. C, you work at a coalition. Or D, you do other things. Okay, it looks like we have about half that are advocates. Um, and maybe another third that are supervisory staff, and then the rest um, is coalition staff and maybe one person that does something else. Great. Now we're going to try out that chat box. So in the chat box, if you just want to put what state or territory you are attending the webinar from, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Oregon, a couple Iowa folks, woo woo, that's where I'm calling in from. West Virginia, more Georgia. Awesome, it looks like we got pretty much all the time zones represented. Awesome, I'm so glad to see we have such a diverse group today. Okay, Eric, would you like to chime in at this point? Sounds like maybe Eric has some technical difficulties. Um, 
Well, for right now, the content of this webinar might be upsetting, so we just want to make sure that you take care of yourself. If at any point you have to um, leave the room or take a break, or uh, uh, several of you have emailed to let me know you might have to leave early, um, I just want to let you know that's perfectly fine. Do what you need to do. I know we, we work at crisis agencies. Things come up, and that is totally fine if you need to leave. Um, at the end of all of our webinars, we send you the handout. Um, from the webinar, so you should be able to take notes or, um, or, or just be able to refer to the webinar later on. Um, and, you know, cross your fingers, the re recording goes well. We'll also send out a recording of the webinar for um, you, so in case you miss any part of it, you can um, look at that. So the goals for our webinar, Eric and I just want to discuss ways that we can increase community involvement in rural areas. Advocates talk to us all the time about how it's really hard to get their communities kind of on board to talk about sexual violence and to do the work that is necessary to end sexual violence in their rural community. Um, and, and I'm really excited to spend the next hour and a half kind of talking about ways that we can um, get them on board and, and work with us. And then also just share really concrete ideas that, that Eric and I have used um, in the field doing direct service. Um, it, that's always a priority for me when doing these webinars is to not just talk about the philosophy, which is so important, um, but also to be able to talk with you guys about concrete ways that, that we've implemented the philosophy into our everyday work. And, and I also want to say that, you know, everyone in this webinar with us today, you are experts in your own areas. and. You know, rural advocates are some of the most creative people on the planet. So um, we also hope that you'll be able to share some of the creative solutions you've come up with in your community, because um, I'm certain they will be helpful for the others that are on the webinar today. So the first thing we want to talk about is, is looking at the history of our own agency. So looking at what has been your agency's history as it relates to your community, because that's going to really inform the way that you move forward with interacting with your community. So, so looking at that history and, and figuring out what, um, what was sort of the inception of your agency, what started it, was there, um, you know, was there sexual violence, locally on the state or national level that brought this to your community um, in a way that, that members banded together and started the agency. I, I think that's a, a really common origin history of sexual assault agencies is um, some sort of sexual violence happened in the community um, and dedicated um, community members have banded together to, to do that, or what is, was your agency born out of maybe a government initiative or, or a local um, government agency in some way? Um, so looking at those major events in your own community's history um, and being able to figure out how that history intersects with how your agency is perceived now um, and how you are see, perceived in the community. And also, this is Eric Stiles, um, to think about the ways that the people involved in that history-making event, who was the individual that came together to form the organization, um, what roles did they play in your community prior to forming the um, organization, and what community ties did they have? Because so often we discuss uh, what's the history of your agency, but we kind of lose sight over what is the history of our ties to the community and are they made on an individual basis? And so often in rural communities we find this paradox happens where if Leah and I start an organization and I have a lot of ties to perhaps the law enforcement officers, that when I leave that organization those ties go with me. Even though everybody knows everybody, those ties leave. So really thinking about that history in the broadest sense of the terms and the context of the history as well. And thanks that's for having me. Yeah, that's such a good point, Eric. And, and yes, welcome to the webinar. We're glad we got that little glitch worked out and happy to have you. Yeah. <clears throat> so when you start talking about who's in your community or communities that are present within your community, it's really 
um, easy for us in real communities um, because this microcosm event happens where you start to look around inside your agency and everybody starts looking the same because you're drawn to the agency and that's what keeps you there as advocates. And that really narrows the focus of who you know lives in your community. So you have to look over what makes up your community. Are there individuals, um, pockets that we don't normally talk to within our community? For example, in the agency I came from, it was originally founded by women. Um, it was a sexual violence agency solely, and they were mostly white women. However, as time went on, about 15 years, there was this um, influx of Latino uh, immigrants that came to our area, speci specifically from Puerto Rico. And we didn't find that context. The agency didn't find that context until they sat down and thought, who's in the area? And they also found out there was a large Vietnamese population that no one had spoken to over time. And this goes, dates back to uh, post-Vietnam War because of the VA Center. So really looking at what is your community make, made up of and what do those communities do for their activism? Um, each of these communities have their own activism in my community, for example. And for um, the Latino community, there was a lot of English as a second language that was going on, activism. And for the Vietnamese, it was primarily around their churches they did activism for helping each other economically. And as soon as we start realizing and figuring out how to communicate, it really opened a door to building larger sense of community and the wholeness that's there. And we really saw more and more of what made up our community. <coughs> So as we move forward, keeping that in mind, so much of our work is done behind the scenes without any community involvement. And, and that's the way we lose contact with those that we serve. Um, we keep confidentiality. We keep the rights of survivors uh, as a core and foundational aspect of our work. And in doing so, a lot of, most of our advocacy work is done behind closed doors. We uh, work within the medical system and the legal system, but the community at large does not see this work. And often they only see the work that we do in prevention around one month a year, around possibly sexual assault awareness month. Other than that, what they see from us is very limited, maybe a fundraising event. So we really fall off the radar for our communities that we live in. So there are ways that we can change that purview and help them understand who we are and what we do and who we are helping. And some of those ways that we do that is through possibly open houses, um, having members of your community come in and see the agency. And this goes beyond the funders that come in. This goes to a general open house. Um, setting some time apart for individuals to come in and see actually where we work and talk to them about the people that we see. Um, finding focus groups. Focus groups are very, very important in opening up the sense of community. It's not only showing the community, but it's also having conversation and dialogue. So a way of doing that is through focus groups. And it can be broken apart in a myriad of ways. We can have focus groups that are <coughs> solely around a topic such as medical care for sub survivors, or we can have focus groups around building resiliency in our community. So why are some projects we can partner with um, to build resiliency within our community around sexual assault? Um, and this goes to like ideas around events and fairs and how can we do that? If we're only going out in the community and talking about prevent sexual violence, and please come on in and give us some money, which is so often what we do. Um, but we don't support like community events where we don't just do a fair, go to the fair and actually just be a part of it and spread the message of hope and resiliency. So maybe like an art um, booth that we put up for survivors' artwork. Where we're not getting up and talking about how we prevent sexual violence, we're just saying there are survivors in the community, here's how wonderful and lovely they are, and here's how much strength and resiliency they have. And we're a part of that, and we're very thankful to be. That builds resiliency. And some of those projects means that we are not front and center in the community. We're not the only voice. It means joining boards or helping up doing like rails to trails, 
really just being seen as many times as you can as an organization beyond the scope of asking for money and joining prevention campaigns. I love that have, idea, Eric, of, of being a positive presence in your community because you're right, it's too often that our community members just um, see us when something terrible has happened in the news and you speak about it um, or asking for money. Um, and we know we do so much good, so we have to show that positive um, side of our agencies also. And, and I think also um, another way that, that's really helpful is to really use volunteers in um, new and exciting ways. So a lot of times I think we think about using volunteers to do things like answer our crisis line or to support survivors. But there's so many community members that I think um, really care about your mission and want to support your agency but might not have the time or the emotional capacity to do work like that, but they might have enough time to bring their church group to your shelter and um, paint the walls a new color or to you know, disinfect all the children's toys in, in the shelter or in the waiting area of your agency. So using um, volunteers in new ways um, or just in smaller ways that they can see your agency, they can, they can donate things or donate their time um, and see the positive work that you're doing because I think a lot of times community members are sort of afraid to come into our centers if they're not actively seeking services with us. Um, they don't just walk in our doors and say, hey, I'm a community member, it's nice to meet you. Um, so being able to invite them in um, is often really, really helpful too. Exactly. And that goes to, I, I would like to maybe in the chat box if individuals would feel comfortable, um, just by a simple acknowledgement, how many of you have had the experience where you've had disclosures or conversations while you're doing a presentation in the community where you go out and you're talking and someone pulls you off the side afterwards and goes, Eric, I appreciate you joining this presentation. I have a question about my niece or I have a question about my daughter or I too have lived through this experience. That's very common for us, right? Uh, we have lots of those experiences, and I see individuals um, saying they have those experiences. Um, what we're doing by expanding the way we're seeing the public is we're giving more opportunities. It's a little bit easier in my experience from what I've heard from individuals coming forward to come forward at events that where it's not targeting and triggering them. So if we're there and we're doing something in the community like a Rails to Trails event, and they, have, they know my name, they know where I'm from, they can come up to me and talk to me about without being triggered in advance. It feels much more comfortable and at ease for that communication about survivorship or needs. Um, and that kind of leads us into, and I'm looking to see if there's anything in the chat box. Leah, I'm having trouble reading the chat box now just to let you know. Um, so if you see anything, please um, I will definitely out. call anything to your attention. And But actually, right now, Tiffany just asked a great question that I was going to ask you, which is, what is a Rails to Trails event? I've okay. never heard of that. Oh, okay. Um, here's, like, so often we have different things in different communities. Um, in our area, we had a lot of railroads because um, there was a lot of oil drilling in our communities in Pennsylvania which brought about lots of uh, railroads. Years have gone by, we don't use the railroads anymore, so communities are starting to take down the railroads because they're not being used and put in trails for hiking or biking or jogging, and these trails are just kind of kept by the community. We go out, we tear up the railroad tra um, ties, um, move the rock, um, kind of weed it, um, and take care of it so that you have an open community space and then you put in some bridges for um, accessibility as well. Oh, I love that. That's a great way, yeah, to, to be a positive presence in the community at one of those events. That's great. Yeah. Sorry, that was just a little side tangent. Thank you, Eric. Um, no problem. And I know that um, like we all get caught in our own words, so I appreciate that in stopping me. Um, which goes on to this next kind of blank service um, um, surface on the screen about how do we message to our community. Um, so often individuals um, in our movement we have been guilty of, and I don't want to use the big guilt but slightly guilty, it's not something for us to beat ourselves up over, 
Um, but we've kind of been guilty sometimes of our messaging being a one-way telling people what to do or having no opportunity for dialogue. And I don't think that fits very well, well in rural communities. In rural communities, we like to have some dialogue. So if you put a message out there, how can you have the message return through conversation and dialogue? And the reason I come to this conclusion is that the NSVRC put out a project years ago about let's talk about sexual violence campaign. And it's been so very receptive in communities across the country. And it kind of highlights this idea that making space for the community to have conversation. So when you do the messaging, have it be less directive and more dialogue inspiring and tying it to the resources. Um, in our community, uh, we did a postcard series around gay and lesbian individuals, gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgendered individuals, where it's a simple postcard and on it had rainbow colored hearts linked together and it said, all are welcome. On the back, it gave the hotline number to our agency, and it said, we're here for you and for all. And we hand those out at Pride events. Very kind of um, easy messaging campaign, but we opened up for conversation. We didn't have a, a, a directive with it. We didn't say, you need to do this to prevent sexual violence or this many people get assaulted. Instead, we said, we're here for you to have a conversation. I love that, Eric. I'm wondering if um, those that are on the webinar could share maybe how you have shared your message with your community. I'm sure you have shared, you know, have tried really creative ways to share your message of, of um, with, with survivors in your community. And I, I just type, typed a chat box question um, for anyone who'd like to share how you have shared your message with your community. I really like that question, Leah, because it, it's through these conversations that we all can grow from each other's experiences. Oh, I love, um, Brittany said that she goes to all of the LGBTQ meetings at the local colleges, um, and it's a great way to be an ally and a resource. I love that because, um, you know, as someone that would go to those meetings, it's always nice to um, have, a, have a friendly face there and, and someone that, you're right, shows up as an ally um, and a resource um, to, to talk about the services that are available to me. And exactly like Eric's example, um, you know, you're showing to your agency that you're, you're welcoming of all kinds of survivors with diverse backgrounds. Um, so I, I really appreciate that, Brittany. And also I just want to highlight another thing with that, Brittany. Um, it's, it's a really good example of why we need to be consistent in our messaging and be reliable. Um, you have to maintain this conversation, maintain coming back to it, maintain being in the room to listen. Because in our rural communities, um, the populations that don't get served a lot might not have the most trust, especially if you don't look and sound like them. So being present and always coming back and being consistent is very, very important. Um, uh, Bonnie wrote that she uh, joined a local coffee house and provided information um, at the coffee house to, that really provided an opportunity to begin conversation, which I love because that's a really sort of casual, um, you know, feel sort of safe and warm environment to talk to people. And Glenda wrote that she goes to community coalition meetings and also to the Latino resource meetings. So I'm glad that we're really getting a, a diverse um, response to this question. Thanks, guys. Yes, and it, it brings to light that um, when you have all these different groups like LGBTQ meetings or the coffee house or Latino resource meetings, that 
when you do this messaging, um, we have to tailor it for each of the groups we go to. And some of it can be quite extensive. Um, like if the LGBTQ, I mean the LGBTQ meetings or the Latino resource meetings have professionals, how do we tailor our messaging for professionals? Meaning are we there to support other counselors and other agencies? Um, can we provide helpline resources and debriefing after they are face-to-face -face with sexual violence? And then the coffee house might be something as simple as um, a phone number and a message of positivity on coasters to the coffee house, like um, something to the effect of calling the, resource, the, the sexual assault center was one step in my healing and things get better, and then the phone number. It can be that simple, the messaging as well. I think this actually um, actually leads us into our next slide quite well um, about who is at the table with us. So who are we having this dialogue with? You know, um, we got we need to bring a variety of community partners to the table um, to talk. Um, and, and just like we were just talking about, you know, the variety of coffee shops and sort of where all of your community members at some point might be gathered or, or seeking things, and then all the way on up to like coalition meetings where maybe there, there's only a, a really specific type of person that is going to be going to that meeting, someone that works at a social service agency or something. And I just want to highlight, Glenda, that you said you used coffee sleeves in the past. Can you type in the chat box how, how you felt those worked and what was on the coffee sleeve? Because I think that's an excellent creative idea for messaging. And while maybe Glenda, if she feels comfortable writing that in, um, when we talk about who's the table, like Leah was stating, we have to think about the audience and who we're bringing together. And even if it's our table, metaphorically speaking, are we having these meetings in our agency or off-site? And what does that mean for uh, the people you can attract to having a conversation? There's no one answer which is better. It's more of a both end that we need to provide as many different spaces to have these conversations. So some we have to be prepared to go off-site with. Absolutely. Um, when I was working at my last center, we were putting together a sexual assault response team and we were really having difficulty getting medical staff and law enforcement to um, actually want to show up when we would have it, we would host it at our agency and time and time again they just kind of wouldn't show up or, or really sporadically. Um, but we decided that we wanted to take the ownership of that SART um, and put it on everyone and not just us. And so every month when we would meet, we would rotate where it was. So one month it would be at our agency and the next month it would be in a conference room at the hospital and the next month it would be at the police station. And suddenly we got people showing up because they felt an ownership of the, the cause and the group and it wasn't just um, you know, the local crisis center forcing them to send police officers. They felt like they had some ownership over the, the meetings as well and that was really helpful. So sometimes you're right, Derek, it really, Eric, it really is about the table itself. And I see Glenda stated what was on the coffee sleeves. It looks like the information for the program and the numbers and that you serve sexual assault survivors and domestic violence survivors. So are there other ideas and how creative ways that everyone has invited people to the table to discuss sexual violence? Um, not just going to another meeting that's already established like a children and youth meeting, but how have you invited others into having these conversations? If you can use the chat box.
Oh, well, Brittany wrote that um, th that her center shares events on Facebook and then says um, private message me, um, which gives an open door to survivors who use social media. Um, and I think that's a great idea, especially because we know so many sexual assault survivors are, um, you know, are being victimized under the age of 18 um, or, or under the age of 25. And so they're the ones really using social media. They're not um, looking at advertisements in the newspaper or listening to the radio um, for, for things. They're using social media to research um, and reach out to um, resources in their community. So I love that, Brittany. That's great. And I love it too, Brittany. And I just want to go off from what Leah's saying, but also add that social media like Facebook, what we know as well is that older adults and mature adults and those in later in life are using Facebook at a really high frequency for keeping in touch with their grandchildren or sharing photos with each other. And we also know they use it to find resources as well now, especially when you have your site have a Facebook. So be very aware in your messaging that you don't just target youth, but there are individuals in later life that also use your Facebook. Very good point. Um, and I see Bonnie writes, wrote in that um, informational posters and bulletin boards and restrooms and local businesses with tariff tags and at the bomb, the phone number, um, for the support line, a very tried and true method of having those tariff tags um, in the bulletin boards. Also, a thought, if you have them in public areas like restaurants and bars area, bar areas, is coasters or um, notepads um, to have your information and to have conversation starters as well. Um, at my last agency, we actually ended up putting all of our information on um, chapsticks um, because people just, I mean, people love free things at community fairs and things, and they're always going to take a chapstick, and then they're going to keep that in their pocket, and it's going to be around, and it's also not the kind of thing that anyone is going to notice. Um, that you took a free chapstick or that your chapstick has the information for a crisis center on it, kind of like a pen. It's a free thing everyone has, and so no one's going to think, oh, you took that chapstick because you are a survivor or something like that. So that was really helpful for our agency. And Twyla mentions about being careful um, about using social media because it can be used in criminal cases both in a positive or a negative way, and that's very true. Um, and I think that's important for us to keep in mind on how we do that messaging. So if it's private message me, if you would like more resources, um, that's very good to keep in mind that you're keeping it off that public um, domain for the individual to see that court case. But it also means that you need somebody to look at social media. Um, you don't want to have it be once a week, Leah checks the social media. You have to have some sort of schedule, some sort of um, commitment for your staff members to actually um, monitor your social networking. It's just the same as them attending a meeting off-site. So we as staff members need to, I mean, staff and supervisors need to really look at that. What is our capacity to actually work with social media? They're all wonderful, but an agency might not be able to use all platforms. So really kind of dissecting it out, where do you have the capacity, who can do it, and who's familiar with it. Um, uh, before we move on to the next slide, the only other thing I wanted to say was just that I, I have a lot of advocates that tell me all over the country that in their rural community they have a hard time getting people to be invested in um, sexual violence being an issue in their community. Um, and, and I just want to say to that, that that I think that what rural communities have that urban don't is that you are in a position of, um, of the people in power in your community are so much more easy to access. You might be neighbors with or go to church with the person who is the police chief. Um, or, or you have the opportunity to actually get to know the, you know, the attorney in your um, in your county, the county attorney in your county. Whereas, you know, if you were in Chicago, there is no way you could ever get to know every possible um, person in the county attorney's office. So you actually 
are positioned in a great place in your rural community to be able to, it might take a little bit more effort, but get those you know, champions on board um, with trying to get sexual violence out of your community. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's a really great thing about rural communities and something that I love about rural communities. Definitely. <clears throat> so the next side, we've been talking a lot about who's the table, how do we do the messaging. I also think it's important for us to come back to who we are, uh, remembering that our role in the community is as healers and advocates for those who've um, experienced sexual violence. Sounds simple enough. Um, but this is what guides us through this work. Um, and the reason I have it written up there in the statement is because sometimes um, we get caught in a very weird dynamic in rural communities, meaning you go to some meetings and maybe there's a law enforcement um, contingent that's there and a very large law enforcement contingent. And they're talking all about the criminal proceedings, what their needs are, and we kind of get pushed off the side. And we don't see or remember who we are in our role. And that's very valuable. And we have to find ways of communicating that to ourselves as well as others. So we're not only healers to those who experience sexual violence, but we're also healers to those who are affected by sexual violence. And that would be those law enforcement officers. So how do we have conversations with the police officers for what they experience from working with sexual assault survivors? Um, in the community I worked in, for example, a very clear memory for me is I was going to these children and youth meetings where we had a very large law enforcement and children and youth um, case managers. And they kind of rolled along month after month after month. But then we had a very traumatic case come forward for a lot of individuals on this meeting group. And it took us standing up and it providing that support to all the other individuals on that. And we had to figure that out as an agency. So what were our supports and our capacity to help them and advocate for them and be healers for them? And then opening up our helpline and making sure they understood they can call us, that it wouldn't be me they were most likely talking to, but it'd be our volunteers, talking to them about what we can do and support them. Um, those things guide the way we do the work, and it really expands it out past this really small focus of survivors and a very small focus of a small group of significant others, because we're working with the whole community and everybody's affected by sexual violence. And that leads to the way we form our partnerships. If you can clearly define who you are and what your role is, partnerships are very easy to form because then you can start from that point, understanding that I'm an advocate, I'm not the investigator, means I can have a conversation and ask what your needs are, and then we can find some common ground. This comes into play, a very easy example is a jail or a prison setting. Often in those settings in your community, the corrections officers are primarily focused on keeping a safe environment for the corrections officers. They're worried about um, outbreaks of aggression. We can step in and answer part of that question and say, we can help provide you more safety in your jail setting by providing support to those sexual assault survivors, by tr um, helping them find resources and keeping them safe because that mitigates violence in your um, prison setting as well as it mitigates the anger and aggression that comes out from your inmates. We just answer to them what their need is. And it's finding those common goals. And from that point, they'll start seeing that what we do has value. And we start aligning our mission statement to end all forms of social injustice with everybody else. So you start layering it together. And that helps build resiliency in your community. Lee, did you have some points on this? Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely love what you just said, um, Eric. And I think that what, I, what is so helpful is to create a really diverse array of partnerships. And so to try to think outside um, the sort of medical, legal, sort of criminal justice world and to try to also think of creative partnerships 
in other areas of your community. So, for example, um, partnering with a local, you know, uh, early childhood educator or like a daycare um, and swap information with them. Um, you know, you can train them on, you know, signs, early signs of childhood sexual abuse. Um, and they can train you on childhood development, um, or maybe they'll be able to provide some um, pro bono daycare services for one of your support groups if you provide information about um, childhood sexual abuse, or trying to trade information so that we, we also know that we're not going to ever be able to work with all um, sexual assault survivors. There's just so many. And so part of what is so helpful about creating great partnerships in our rural communities is that even if we are not reaching every sexual assault survivor in our community, the agencies that we partnership in conjunction with us are going to reach everyone. And that brings me to another point with this, and that is, how many times are we overlooked and the idea of sexual violence is overlooked? In our community, we had a local vet, um, veterans hospital that was doing a collaborative effort with the homeless shelters to try and bring the veterans in and find them housing. So they would go out to where some of the rural areas where there were campsites that these veterans were using for shelter, and they would take plastic bags with Ziploc bags and put information and then some tack them on trees. And it was basically like, here's the shelter information, here's where you call, and here's the money that we're going to be able to assist you with. It was a very direct, we're going to meet the need by this. They never thought through sexual violence. They never thought through a partnership with us that they might be experiencing sexual violence while experiencing homelessness. We started having conversations about how we can also provide support and provide our hotline information and be there at the hospital or the shelters to help discuss with veterans that were coming in before they got this um, rapid rehousing program and how we could provide support. But it took this unique kind of partnership and thinking outside the box and it only happened by accident. I would like to say it happened on purpose. But it happened by accident in my community because I was talking to a chaplain at the VA about our program and he was providing space for male survivors in the chaplain area that no male survivor would be seen as being a survivor because it's like a hideaway area. So having these conversations, being open to partnerships that kind of go beyond what we're thinking and providing that support for survivors is very, very key. I'm wondering if we could just take a minute to, um, would anyone type in the chat box who your agency has successfully partnered with, um, a, a creative partnership that your agency um, has, has done successfully, um, I think would be great to hear a variety of answers. So Mandy says, law enforcement, the hospital, um, DCF, BIP, and our local college. I'm sure, um, I'm wondering, I, I don't know what DCF or BIP stands for. Betters, in, I guess, Betters Intervention Program, Department of Corrections, okay. Department of Fa Children and Family, Hospital, Sane Nurses, mm -hmm. Those are all great um, um, agencies to partnership with. I would just encourage maybe um, partnering with, with agencies that aren't exclusively affiliated with sort of um, medical or law enforcement. So I'm loving the rural jails. Disability service providers, oh, that's great, Marsha. Um, EMS and, and CPS.
Wow, I got you guys being all talkative now. I love it. Fani says that her agency partnered with an alternative education center for adolescents who are not successful in the public school system. Oh, that is great. You pro they provide a public, um, I'm sorry, they provide a health curriculum that focuses around healthy relationships and gender stereotypes. Um, and Twyla has been working with the victim's assistance at the DA's office. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. That's that was a great list. Mm -hmm. Seems to keep, keep time. We'll go. We'll move on unless Eric, you had something to say. I was going to say that's a great list, and uh, the one thing I would suggest is you have such a good core here of um, groups that you're talking to already in your communities, and. Everybody you work with there, because so many people in rural communities wear different hats. So for example, in my community, I was the sexual assault advocate, but I also worked at the LGBT Center. And I did all these other things that when you start tying into these systems, start finding out where people also give their time to. Because a lot of these um, agencies you're already working with already are working with people under times of crisis and stress, but there are other agencies like libraries or churches or public parks that you can also do some collaboration with to work with sexual assault survivors. That's a very good point. So here's some homework for your agency. Um, I know Chris is on the line right now, and she is the one who's kind of taught me about giving homework. I'm never really fond of homework, but this is some homework for your agency. So what are your agency services that you provide, um, meaning how do you explain those um, to the public? Um, what is the makeup of your agency, uh, who works there, who volunteers there, and who are already existing contacts for your agency? The reason these three questions are here is it will help you better communicate and find partnerships in your community. If you have services that you provide, for example, often centers have in rural communities a women's group that is weekly, that has gone on for a number of years, which is excellent. It's there. But when we talk to other agencies, we say we provide groups, right? But there's a disconnect there. We have one group, but we don't have any other groups. So really being able to describe your agency services, and that triggers us to think through what else can we do. And then we can talk about what's the makeup of our agency. And that comes back to having a staff meeting, talking to our staff and volunteers about what is it that everybody brings to the table. I always think it's a great idea to bring staff together and say, hey, what brought you to the work again, uh, especially when you have new staff. I'm having everybody share from that. What are your hobbies? What do you do outside of here? Really seeing what is the makeup of your agency and the people beyond skin color and beyond gender. Um, really talking to people about who they are because that really helps your agency move forward because then you're sparking them to think about those other aspects of their life, and they might have some great ideas rolling around in their head they just haven't been able to formulate. And then <clears throat> going into who are already existing contacts for agency. I know so many times I've gone to different centers, and their contacts are kind of lost because they're individually based. So Leah has her contacts, I have my contacts, and Chris has her contacts. So what is the context your agency has? So that means trading some of them. So Leah, I've been going to this LGBT group for every month for a year. Would you like to join me in my next group um, that I go to? Because I want you to be able to step in if I get sick or to be there. And so they have some more people to see from our agency. Because our agency provides support to survivors as a whole, not as an individual. So really spreading that around. What about your thoughts, Leah? That's great. I have nothing to add. You said it all perfectly, Eric. <laughs> okay. We put that in the calendar. <laughs> yes. Um, so the next part is talking about, and this is kind of like the yucky thing, um, talking about for me, it already was policies and documents, <laughs> meaning um, they always felt rigid when I first started working in the field. They were like, just the thing you read, you got told about when you got hired, and that was the end of it. It wasn't until I had a really, really interesting advocate teach me some things and talk to me about how policies are living docu uh, documents, 
and they're guidelines to help your agency grow for all survivors. And if we look at policies like that and less restrictive, it really changes our view on how we provide services. So going back to the policies on what it means to work outside or off-site in your agency, just that one policy, if you can go back and look at that. Do you have any policies about working off-site, how you make partnerships, how you provide like a peer group, the Drug and Alcohol Treatment Center, um, and you have a counselor there? Really thinking through that question will start changing the way that policy is away from so often is no transporting clients in your own car or survivors in your own car or the idea of <clears throat> no meeting survivors in a public space. We really need to have some bigger conversations how we provide that support. So that might mean our policies get a little bit more intricate, intricate and they change more, but it means we provide more support for future survivors. And as we move forward, um, um, so often the messaging that we put out in the community is a reaction to the pain of violence. And do we still see the ability for healing in better days? And that's something I can't stress enough. Um, go back to your agency, look at the walls, look at the posters. I know my agency used to have um, these posters that were very depressing and anxiety-filling, uh, anxiety-filled posters that <coughs> my survivors would tell me, and the one survivor said, it's the wall of despair, because one poster had a small child crying in the corner saying, Daddy had no right to touch me. Another one said, no one has the right to hit you if a woman has a bruise on her face, and they're all black and white with shadows. And the other one was, uh, we can prevent sexual violence. You don't, um, no one has the right to rape. There was no message of hope. There was no message of healing or better days. And after seeing that, the other advocate that I worked with and I worked on an art project in our agency where we took the whole hallway and we painted it blue and green at the bottom. And then we had survivors, we invited them in to take their hands and use only their hands to make imprints on the wall. And they made trees, they made clouds, they made birds, they made a house, they made a barn, they made animals. But they all worked together and they wrote messages of hope to each other by their handprint. And that really starts shifting the way we did our messaging. Our executive director looked at that and thought, huh, that really does resonate with survivors on how you can heal and you can give messaging to each other. And I see, Leah, you have a question, so I'll let you ask it. Thanks, Eric. Um, I was just wondering how everyone else in the webinar has maintained a positive presence in their community. I love your example, Eric. My Chris knows this, that my biggest pet peeve is agencies that, that have those sad, um, sad posters on the walls. Um, I just think it's so important to, to show a positive attitude to survivors because we know survivors are resilient and strong um, and just showing posters where they, where they look like victims and defeated is just so tragic. So I'm really, I'm very happy to know that about you, Eric, that you did that at your last agency. Um, the, the other thing I was gonna say about putting a positive presence in our communities is just to, um, we talked a little bit earlier about this, but you know, having staff attend community events um, and fairs gatherings um, and you know, providing outreach to people um, in, in positive ways like um, hosting, um, support groups that aren't about sexual violence, but are just about maybe women coming together to do a craft night, or community members coming together to cook a meal together, because we know these are resources that our community needs. Um, and then we know when we when we give an outlet for them to come and share positive things, inevitably the disclosures come after. Um, but I'm wondering if anyone else has. Um, interesting things to say about how you've maintained a positive presence in your community.
and while individuals type in, I, I just want to kind of say that putting a positive message out there is not fluff. Um, I've heard that from sometimes from individuals saying, well, we have to do the serious work of preventing sexual violence. And my response to that is that it's not fluff, it's not skipping over the preventative techniques that we use, it's providing support to the resiliency and looking at survivors as whole individuals and they're not broken or damaged goods. And by doing so, it leaves more space increases that space in our community for survivors to come forward and talk. Oh, I see some individuals typing in right now. Uh, face painting, great. Well, that's okay. We can move on. And if you think of it, if you think of other things, don't hesitate to type in the chat box. Oh, looks like Christy says they participate in health fairs, awesome, and do a sexual assault walk every April um, and have a women's wellness event in the fall. That's, that's um, really great so that you have, it's not just that one time a year in April you're doing something, but you know, six months later in the fall you have another event. That's great, Christy. Um, and Glenda also gives away stuffed toys at the county fair. I'll have to come visit. Wonderful. So another way that we can provide, um, get more community involvement is call to action letters, letters to the editor, survivor love letters, which is something that just happened in the month of April for Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And I can send the link. Um, that is something, these are things of way of assisting survivors in being able to share their stories and feel a positive response in the community. And it helps the community see that we're not, quite frankly, just a battered woman's shelter. Because so often we have that perception um, that, and then there's nothing that they can do. But a call to action or a letter to the editor or survivor love letters really shifts the conversation for others. And I'll type that in the box. Do you have anything to say, Leo? Nope. That is okay. perfect. I was actually just trying to type that in for you, but you beat me to it. Yeah. And the great thing about Survivor Love Letters as well, <clears throat> I would suggest everybody take a look if they're very useful and um, if you have survivors that would like to see some something, you can um, show them while they're in your office with you. You can use them. And you can also create your own for the office space to put around. And it really um, elicits a, a really healthy response. And so as we go forward, the next slide, um, we really talk about finding champion in your community. And finding champions within our community sometimes feels daunting or it feels very frustrating or it can be quite heartbreaking if you had a community champion. Um, my local community, I had a sheriff that originally came from Georgia who moved to the area and he was the most wonderful champion, but he retired. And re he, when he retired, it felt like this big hole was there. Um, so we had to work double, double our efforts and find champions. And one thing that my executive director found in finding the champions for sexual violence in our community was they had some common traits. And those common traits were, A, they understood us, so they knew what our role was, what our work was, and who we helped. B, they understood their role, what their work is, and who they helped, and how they helped survivors. Everything else, we worked out as we went along. So they might not have known about young males being sexual assault survivors. We provide the education with that. <clears throat> but as long as they knew their role, they figured their way through it. So if you can look at it from that way, 
in your community, who understands their role really, really well, and who understands sexual violence. Everything else is workable. Once you're able to identify who that champion in your community is, um, you know, then you can try to use them really creatively. Um, I, I really encourage you to find out where their passion lies with being a champion for this cause um, and figure out, you know, would you be most happy supporting us by being a volunteer, by being on our board, by, you know, supporting fundraising efforts, whether that is actually giving monetary funds or just, you know, being a spokesperson for the fundraising events, encouraging participation in fundraising events, um, just spreading things by word of mouth because we know often when we find champions in our community, they just have so much social clout in our small rural communities that um, when they are passionate about a cause, that is just infectiously spread um, to those that they are close with and those that are around them, which is often a, a large chunk of our community. Um, or they might have some sort of professional role that could lend itself well, like um, allowing, you know, if they are someone that on the law enforcement, maybe they can allow you access to train police officers on this issue. Or if maybe they work in the school system, they might be able to lobby to have you bring educators into the school system um, when previously maybe you hadn't really been able to find an in. So really trying to figure out what draws them to the work, what they are passionate about, and then you can find a way to use their passion to assist your movement. Um, but really to, to find what they're passionate about, I think it's really helpful. Yes, it is. And to go off from what you're saying, also finding how you can provide support to them. So does that mean a monthly phone call check-in? Or does it mean attending their meetings? Or does it mean providing support um, and availability for them to discuss their feelings about sexual violence if they're a survivor and helping them work through things? So really us also providing them with the support they need to work with sexual violence. And that goes to community teams. So you find some champions, you find some people who come up and speak for you and speak to the agency and survivors. <coughs> now really looking at community response teams. And this sounds very similar to sexual assault response teams. However, we're stretching the definition to beyond the normal roles that we get, and that is the law enforcement, um, legal, and medical. We're now expanding out into educators. We're expanding out into libraries, librarians. We're expanding out into social workers. We're expanding out into um, shelter workers or veterans or corrections officers. So really getting a broad community response team, and that also includes survivors. And while we get the team together, um, the focus I find that's very beneficial and the one that we created was community resiliency. It was easier for bringing a lot of individuals together to talk about how we can build resiliency in the community <coughs> rather than prevention or an intervention strategy about a current event. So what I mean by this is, if we had the team together and we were discussing prevention, people got muck and mired into their roles and got kind of confused and there were people that were kind of maybe um, not sure of themselves. If we talked about how we can work together as a whole community and build resiliency and building spaces that survivors can uh, feel free and where they can go and decreasing the barriers and the uh, challenges of survivors to come forward, um, creating places for survivors not to be bullied, and in general, the community not being bullied. Um, those sort of aspects, it went very well. But the prevention, we pull off the group of people that wanted to work on that. Or an intervention, like a case came up. Well, we know that the medical and the legal side maybe came for our children and youth. And those individuals, we'd have different meetings with them. But we had a community resiliency team. And it wasn't done on a monthly basis. We did it every two months. Um, and that team, what it did was it created the space for them to work together. After it got going, these individuals actually continued on in their own. Um, and they continued on in their own way. It, they became involved in teaching about diversity in our community. So we were just a part of that, 
um, but it really helped out our agency and survivors. I love that idea, Eric, because we know that, that rural communities are so passionate about their communities and making their community a safe, warm, welcoming space. Um, and that, that definitely involves resiliency. Yes. And um, so when you move forward um, with these teams, um, one thing that we talked about but we never got to while I was there was the community storytelling project or history project. Um, and we never even called it that. Um, actually in our community it was more of the, the essence of gathering up what's the message we want everybody to know about our community. Um, but since then, I know I've worked with other projects that are doing some of this storytelling or history project for your community. And these sort of things can build the community to sense of togetherness. Because what we're finding is that rural areas are not unlike urban areas and that there's a transient population. People are moving in and out, as well as the population is maybe losing some of their history because youth are moving out. So really kind of galvanizing that around some history really creates resiliency and you help find your space in that history. Um, and that's really important because if you're seen as an outsider within your community, often you won't get as much buy-in. But if you're part of the history, like we've been here 30 years, um, it adds to your credibility and it adds to your ability to um, have credit within your community, social credit. So the next couple slides we're going to talk about are some ideas. Um, the one I already brought up was educational summits. Um, these are merely ways of bringing individuals together. Certain, they can be survivor-led as well, educational summits. But they're educational summits for your community. Um, for example, in the HIV field, there's often educational summits for new doctors in the community I worked in. So those with HIV would actually instruct the doctors on bedside manner and common best practice. Um, we can use those ideas within the survivor movement. So what would it be like for survivors to talk about what the experience is for them, what they would like to see for their medical treatment in the community? We can sponsor those and with those really get some buy-in um, from the medical field, for example. So that's one way, a concrete way that we can get more buy-in. And professionals love educational summits as well because you're offering free training. So get partners in. And if you can get continuing education credits, even better. And it helps highlight your professionals and community. And the next one I'm madly in love with, um, anybody who knows me knows I love working with survivors in arts and doing art shows. It's something that our community really picked up and it was wonderful in all the different ways. And we had some champions um, from the community. We had an older art professor and an art instructor that were married, um, that were both retired, that came in and said, we would only like to work with just helping them create art. We know our way around art. Um, we believe in what you do but we can't help people. We, they really said we can't just help people. We don't know what we could do. But if you're there, you could help the people. Um, what they meant by that was they didn't feel like they had anything to give a survivor. Well, they started coming in. They went through our 40-hour training. They actually put themselves through that. They showed in our team group, for example, how to make art out of um, glass. They walked away energized, donated all the supplies, brought in more artists, we started getting art students coming in that would take the 40-hour training and that was their champion role. They would come in and help us provide art shows, um, getting the space, setting it up correctly, helping individuals create art. The different groups that we had in our agency would create art for each other. The teen group um, had some art created for them by the adult group. We had a mixed gender adult group that wanted to give a message of hope to the young teens they knew were coming into the agency, so they create artwork for them. And we started getting this dialogue back and forth through art. So it, I, I cannot, if you have somebody who's creative and likes art on your staff, this is a way of helping them channel that and find some really good outlets for it. And it really creates this spirit of resiliency for individuals. In a community not far from here this year, they did a 
Thrive in the Sun art show after their Take Back the Night. So they have their Take Back the Night the day after they did a Thrive in the Sun art show, and it was brought together different community members from across different anti-oppression work, and they did this huge art show that was very, very well received. What I love about your idea, Eric, is just that um, is that it one it shows survivors that their community cares that you know these people are coming in and donating their time and supplies to um, help them make art and so it's really showing survivors that you know they're not alone and their community supports them in their healing and also it gets you know if you can display the artwork in your community it gets you know, awareness out in your community that this is something that's happening and also that you're such a great agency that is able to provide services and you're also having community members that are participating involved. It's just, it's such a great idea to get so many different people um, on board with, with knowing about your agency. I, I really love that. And I love the way that art resonates with people. You don't have to use words and it can resonate at such a deeper level. And the one thing that resonated a lot for our art, art our survivors and the artists that came in was the idea that they were believed because they believed the piece of artwork. They believed mm -hmm. in their power of creation. And I couldn't, I can go on for hours about how wonderful it was. Um, and that leads us to, there's only like two more um, slides, but this one is about community meals. Um, having just community meals together, a community potluck, uh, we used to have that in our country quite a bit where communities came together over food. Uh, we've drifted away from that. But bringing together different agencies, providing food to get people together to just share a meal really lowers barriers and lowers um, misconceptions. And it brings people together in a spirit of community that really gets them involved. Um, we had a couple in our community that were around the Latino community, and they were just wonderful events where we just, we sponsored, I think the one event we brought in, I, just the plantains. We fried plantains because we figured out how to do that well and to make them sweet. So that was our role as an agency, and we brought that food along to this huge potluck. And people just saw us for people, and they started becoming involved and curious. And that was really, really uh, a way of lessening that fear over talking to us because we were the sexual assault center. Great idea. I love it. And the last one, this is not a picture of what Rails to Trails is. However, this is something similar to what Rails to Trails looks like. Um, we made them uh, wheelchair accessible, so you put in boards and you have this little trail. And we did those, and that really helped out with the community seeing us for something as a part of their community. I think that's key. Um, if the community can see us as part of their community and actually be involved at all levels, it really creates a, an environment where you get more involvement and you get more donations, more volunteers, more survivors coming forward, and you become the part of the fabric of the community rather than this isolated tower that no one has an idea of who you are. And the last thing I had to say before questions and answers is let your imaginations run wild. Your staff, your um, volunteers, the people you're in contact with have great imaginations. Let them run wild. Some will succeed. Some will not succeed as well, but you will always learn something. And as long as you have the best intentions, it really moves forward and it's such a good way. I just want to thank Eric for joining us and ask um, if anyone has any like last minute questions, um, clarification, resources that you need from us, don't hesitate to type it in the chat box right now. And this part of the work really re-energizes you as an advocate too. I just had to throw that out there. In my time doing this sort of work, it really made me feel more energized because it takes away from the trauma that I carried around from always seeing people as victims of sexual violence and hearing about the offenders. It really brought into light that there's so much more to the world 
so much more to the survivors. And it really helped me stay balanced as an advocate being able to do this work. That's an ad benefit about doing this community involvement work like this, is your advocates can balance themselves out because now you're not just hearing all day long the stories of trauma. You're also hearing and sharing stories of hope and you're creating a sense of community which draws you out of that because um, advocates do experience vicarious trauma. <clears throat> and thank you so much, Leah, for having me on this webinar. It's something I love and thoroughly enjoy. Well, I always love doing webinars with you, Eric. It's always so much fun, and I, and I learn along the way. So um, I just want to say, you know, once again to Eric, that's his contact information on the screen. And once again, I, like I said before at the beginning, that we'll be emailing out a copy of the PowerPoint, and so his contact information will be on that. Um, and as well as my contact information and a link to our website. And we just want to say thank you um, to OVW um, for allowing us to bring you this webinar. So I'll just keep this up if anyone has any last minute questions. Otherwise, thanks so much for joining. Okay, well, it looks like I'll let you go. There's no more questions. Have a good afternoon, everybody, and thanks again for joining us. Take care, everyone. Thank you.